prior to our study of the torso, we have spent some time with nerve structures of both the upper limb and the lower limb. You'll perhaps remember that these are spinal nerves, nerves that derive from the spinal cord, which runs through the vertebral column, which is part of our study at present. The spinal nerves form plexi, and perhaps you'll remember some of these. Let's review for a moment. The cervical plexus and the brachial plexus were both mentioned in the upper limb, although we spent 99% of our time with the brachial plexus, from which nerves of the shoulder and the upper limb are derived. Uh, we spent very little time with the cervical plexus because um, there aren't too many significant nerves from there. In our unit right now on the torso, we're going to be spending time just looking briefly at these thoracic nerves. And then you'll remember from the lower limb, both the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus, hopefully. So these are the, the layout of the spinal nerves. And we're looking at the thoracic nerves now. Just briefly, though, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They come out from between the vertebra through the intervertebral foramina. Or for the sacral nerves, they come out of the various sacral foramina. In the thoracic nerve area, the nerves in this area come out one by one. Um, the nerves do not form a plexus. As you can see here, let's enlarge that a bit. You can see that the nerves coming out of the spinal cord continue around the body, around the thoracic or the torso area. These nerves are typically called the intercostal nerves. In fact, if you've been part of a dissection or will be part of our cat dissection, we will find these intercostal nerves in our dissection. Um, intercostal meaning between the ribs. So these are the nerves from T1 through T12. These are the ones known as the thoracic nerves. So not a whole lot to mention here, other than each one will innervate the muscles, breathing muscles between the ribs. And uh, and they don't form a plexus. These are individual. The spinal nerves come out and don't weave together with other nerves. They just continue around the body, innervating the little bit that's there. We will deal with all of these nerves in a little more detail when we talk about the spinal cord um, in a future unit on the nervous system. So that's pretty much it for these nerves. There is one special nerve, though, that we should mention here in this thoracic unit. And it's formed by a nerve from the cervical plexus. We mentioned all sorts of nerves from the brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus. But one nerve from the cervical plexus is going to be important to us here. The cervical plexus forms a nerve called the phrenic nerve. And let's just point it out. You can see branches of C3, C4, and C5 spinal nerves here are coming together to, to form a single nerve. This nerve runs down through the neck, down through the thoracic cavity, all the way to a muscle that's very, very important to us, the diaphragm. And hopefully you remember this from our lecture on the muscles. The diaphragm is your most prominent breathing muscle. This is the muscle that breathes for you moment by moment. If you had to remember to breathe, you'd be in big trouble. And it's a fascinating muscle because it's a skeletal muscle, and yet it works um, in an independent way. It works like a smooth muscle might, um, which doesn't have a conscious innervation. We, we think of it as involuntary. And yet this is a skeletal muscle. It's a muscle that you can control if you want. You can breathe with your diaphragm in a conscious way. But if you're not thinking about it, this muscle also works for you without your thinking. So what's so interesting about this? Well, where this nerve comes from, the fact that it comes from the cervical plexus high up in the neck and yet innervates a muscle 
down in the torso between the abdominal and thoracic cavities. And the question would be why? Is there some reason why it might be this one muscle down in our torso might be connected into our neck? And the simple answer would be that you would want a muscle so important to you, as important as breathing, connected as close to the brain as possible. One of the things that happens in people accidentally is sometimes damage to their spinal cord. And if it's serious, a person can be paraplegic or quadriplegic. Um, and this has the potential then to cut off a person's breathing since the breathing muscle is halfway down their torso. So what kind of a, what kind of damage to the spinal cord would be one that could cause a person to stop breathing? And it turns out that that um, damage to the spinal cord would have to be very, very high in the neck for it to be able to disrupt the connection between the brain and the diaphragm and the breathing muscle. When this happens, if the spinal cord is damaged in this way, it's usually called a hangman's fracture. A hangman's fracture would occur at or above the C3 vertebra, the C3 spinal nerve. Um, if the nerve comes from here, any damage above it would sever the connection between the brain and the nerve. It's called a hangman's fracture because this is what the hangman's noose would typically do. If it was done in a, if hanging was done in a humane way, the person doesn't strangle to death. Um, the person is usually hanged on a platform. A trap drawer door drops out from under them and they fall and the rope around their neck then breaks some of the vertebra in the neck, damages the spinal cord, and cuts off the ability for the brain to cause the diaphragm to work. In essence, the diaphragm does not breathe for the person. The brain, even in an unconscious way, is sending signals, but they are not getting through because the connection between the two has been severed. This is what a, a hangman's fracture does. It interrupts that message. Probably the most notable example of this was from several years ago. Uh, a man named Christopher Reeve, who played Superman um, back in the 20th century, um, was part of a, he, he liked to ride horses, he was part of an equestrian event. And Unfortunately, his horse bolt stopped very abruptly at uh, something it was supposed to jump. He went flying over the front of the horse. Arms got caught in the reins, and it landed right on his head and his neck and sustained a hangman's fracture. Um, he was very involved in movies and all of that. And so after that, um, he was confined to a wheelchair. He could not breathe on his own. He had a respirator um, under his wheelchair, um, and you can see the scarf around his neck would hide the connection. He had a, an opening into his trachea in his neck, and the machine was constantly breathing for him. He did go on to direct several movies and do many other projects, and um, was very instrumental in furthering spinal cord research and all of that. Um, but this hangman's fracture was a very serious thing for him. Here's what it would look like in an x-ray. And perhaps you can see that, that dark line through the vertebra there. Here's kind of what that would look like if you show that. This is what that x-ray was looking at. You can see the axis, the C2 vertebra, is broken here. And so the spinal cord that would be in under that would be severed. And so the signals from the brain don't get past that and don't get to the C345 nerve. And so the connection never gets, the, the breathing signals from the brain, even in a person unconscious, does not get through. So the phrenic nerve is very, very important. And it's just fascinating that 
it doesn't come out in the thoracic area. You would think if the diaphragm's down below your rib cage that one of the thoracic nerves would be the nerve connected to the diaphragm. But if that were the case, you know, and you were looking at it, you could see that if it was, say, the thoracic nerve six, seven, or eight, damage above that, you know, anywhere in the upper thoracic or upper cervical area, any of those kinds of damage would be able to cut off your breathing. The way we're connected right now, the damage, you could have damage, say, in the lower cervical area. You could be a quadriplegic. You wouldn't be able to move a muscle below your neck, and yet your diaphragm would be the one muscle in your torso that would continue to work because it's connected so high in the neck. So that's the, um, those are the nerve structures that are significant to us in the torso. The individual thoracic nerves that form the intercostal nerves of the rib cage, and this phrenic nerve that is so important to the functioning of the diaphragm. But 